Good morning, everybody, uh, and welcome to this morning's event. We'll just wait a couple of minutes to allow everyone an opportunity to, to enter into the webinar, um, and then we'll get started. Good morning to everyone who's just joined us. We'll just uh, allow a couple of minutes for people or a minute or two for people to log in and join the event and then we'll get underway with uh, the formal proceedings. Good morning to those that have just recently joined us. We'll just give just a moment for the last, uh, well, hopefully not the last few people, but for the, for the next people to jump into the event and then we'll start proceedings. Good morning, everybody. We may start now. I can see that our uh, the numbers of people who have joined the event is ticking well up into the hundreds now, which is fantastic to see. I'd like to welcome you all um, to the event this morning um, for the 16 days of activism and also launching the Family Violence Training Hub at Chisholm. I'd like to introduce a few people to you this morning. So firstly, I'd like to welcome Miss Gabrielle Williams, who is the elected member for one of Chisholm's local electorates of Dandenong. Minister Williams is the Minister for Aboriginal Affairs, the Minister for Women, and the Minister for the, for the Prevention of Family Violence. A very warm welcome to you this morning, Minister Williams. I'd also like to introduce the facilitator of our Q&A session today, who is Dr. Ilsa Evans. She's also our course coordinator for the Graduate Certificate in Family Violence at Chisholm and a published author. Ilsa has been a long-standing champion for the need of formal, for formal training in family violence prevention and response. And finally, I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker, Jess Hill. Jess is an investigative journalist who co collaborates with people to investigate issues around social justice, domestic violence, energy policy, resources, corruption, and human rights. Jess has been writing and researching about domestic abuse since 2014. Her book on the phenomenon of domestic abuse, See What You Made Me Do, was awarded the 2020 Stella Prize and has been adapted into a three-part docuseries for SBS. Her reporting on domestic abuse has won two Walkley Awards, an Amnesty International Award, and three Our Watch Awards. Today, Jess will be presenting on the topic of, where are we now? Working towards the elimination of men's violence against women. Thank you and over to you, Jess. Thank you so much, Connor, and thanks so much, everyone, for having me. It's um, amazing to be here. I um, love the work of the Chisholm Institute, and it's been great to have um, some involvement with you guys over the last year or so. Now, I speak to you today from Sydney on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. They're the traditional owners of this land, and their sovereignty was never ceded. And I pay respects to their elders past and present and acknowledge the caregiving they've given this country for over 60,000 years and continue to today. Now, I think 
people are probably taking a bit of a deep breath um, at both at the beginning of these um, 16 days, but also as we're coming to the end of this gigantic year, um, a year that's been both terribly small and quiet as well as world shaking. And our lives, and particularly yours in Melbourne, were squashed into four walls for much of 2021. And the public arena was largely off limits. And yet what was happening out there was a reckoning on gendered violence and an insurgency um, against the federal government that's unlike anything we've ever seen in this country. Four women in particular, um, the late Kate Thornton, who left behind detailed allegations of a violent rape against our then Attorney General. Brittany Higgins, who levelled not just allegations of rape against a fellow staffer inside Parliament House, but exposed the moral cowardice of the government she worked for. Grace Tame, whose focus on educating the nation on grooming and child sexual abuse realised um, in the months um, leading, uh, you know, through the year that, that much of these same techniques were being used by politicians against the nation at large. And Chanel Contos, who revealed to Australians that sexual assault between teenagers and particularly elite private school students was had virtually become the norm at weekend parties and that we as Australians live in a rape culture. So these four women in very different ways triggered this citizen-led insurgency against the government, which raged for months and also showed that we now have a class of mostly female senior reporters who will not be hoodwinked by the old tricks anymore, who have learnt the lessons of the Gillard era and who will not blanch at reporting politics through a gendered lens um, and will actually fight alongside us for truth, recognition and for politicians to put substance behind their rhetoric. So this was a real resurgence of um, Australia's Me Too movement um, and it was really back with a vengeance this year because... At its heart, this is an accountability movement coming up against a government that refuses to be accountable. Political spin really has no power against this because the proponents of it are weary of powerful speeches followed by business as usual. And I think broadly this movement has had a very straight and confronting question uh, for men generally, which is what will it take for your kind to stop coercing, harassing, raping and killing women and of power the question is what will it take for you to stop protecting the men who perpetrate this and to our prime minister the message is really clear that passionate speeches will not appease us we see you and we won't take just the flowery rhetoric any flowery rhetoric anymore as a promise for what might happen in the future we will judge things on their merits so this is the cultural context we've been operating in this year, and it's been one of many raised hopes that were then dashed, uh, like the announcement from Morrison that the government would wholly or in part accept all of the recommendations from Respect at Work, only to turn around and reject the central one, the most important one, the one that everything sort of hangs off, the scaffolding, um, which would require employers to prevent sexual harassment. Um, and doing that, you know, in the week preceding the National Women's Safety Summit, where participating had the potential to make you feel complicit in this double think, in this, these, this rhetoric, this untruth, um, to feel played. And in the words of Shana Bremner from End Rape on Campus, you know, the, the government was expecting us to eat a shit sandwich and smile while we ate it. But there's a really important line between cynicism and realism, and it's one we're all pretty used to finding um, our, our balance on. Cynicism can blind us to the positive changes that are taking place. Realism, I think, you know, requires us to assess everything on its actual merits, not just on pretty promises or good intentions. Um, but I think, you know, I had a very interesting conversation with Catherine Murphy from The Guardian um, about this and about I think what she said about cynicism is that it can lead to flabby thinking um, and it can also lead to um, being drawn into ideology or being drawn to see things through a particular lens rather than re retaining that clear thinking. But you don't, want to, you don't want to be so resistant to cynicism that you avoid realism. Um, 
So what have we actually seen this year then in the area of domestic abuse and family violence and sexual abuse? It probably won't surprise many of you who might be familiar with my work um, that I put the national conversation around coercive control at the top of my list. Um, I don't think that's too subjective. I think that, that has been like, you know, a major, a major part of what we've been looking at this year that has been significantly different. Um, and that's not because coercive control is, is a new um, is a new idea, uh, but it certainly has not been communicated uh, to the community or even really talked about in the sector so explicitly. So, you know, generally the, the terminology has been much more about power and control. It's been about describing the various techniques. But I think for the first time, we've really started to understand what coercive control looks and feels like. And that, and when I say we, now I'm talking about the community, that domestic abuse is not just about violent men and bad tempers. Um, but it is in so many cases a process of entrapment um, in which different types of abuse and the removal of rights and independence um, combined with the appearance of love and care um, and things that we're, we actually feel like often attracted to, um, protection, you know, these types of things in relationships that, that they, these all combine um, and create an all too often lethal pattern. And that really what we're talking about when we talk about coercive control is not just various types of abuse, but about a plot line that repeats from one relationship to the next. And that is so predictable that you really can, when you hear part of a, sto a woman's story, you can really sort of pretty much plot what's going to happen next. Um, and most terribly, it's a predictable precursor to domestic homicide. So as has been oft repeated since this debate began, in 78 out of 79 domestic homicides in New South Wales between 2017 and 2019, the perpetrators used coercive control against their victims. Um, and these homicides were predictable um, as the work of Jane Monkton Smith has made clear. Um, for those of you who may not know her work, she's a UK based criminologist. She developed the eight stage homicide timeline and has a, an incredible new book out called In Control. It's a pattern of oppressive controlling behaviour that should ring the loudest alarm bells for us in terms of future risk of homicide um, and not just the level of physical violence. And I guess the big wake up call really around coercive control, but also that um, the lethality or the lethal potential of that need for control where physical violence may be absent was, was, was best exampled in the horrific case of um, Hannah Clark and her three kids um, when they were murdered by Rowan Baxter last year, in February last year. Um, and again, we saw um, a family, family members step up and become very powerful advocates, um, Lloyd and Sue Clark, Hannah's parents, who had not known about the concept of coercive control while their daughter and their grandchildren were still alive, but they had known that, that Rowan was was a dangerous person. Um, they had known that they hated the way that he treated their family. Um, they had known that Hannah needed to get out of that relationship. What they hadn't known was just how lethal that behaviour could be um, and how that could, that could proceed um, murder. And they have made it their life mission now to educate the community. Um, obviously they, they are particularly intent on criminalising coercive control. Um, and that's a large part of the reason why Queensland is now conducting a, a, such an enormous inquiry headed by um, Ma Margaret McMurdo, uh, which is going to start reporting back in November, both on legislating against coercive control, but also a root and branch um, inquiry into the criminal justice system and how it responds to um, victim survivors. So really what we're understanding is that coercive control is a system of abuse that is essentially about depriving the victim of their human rights and their liberty and their sense of self. So I tend to describe it as a, as a system of entrapment because the ultimate goal is to erode someone's sense of self, to reduce them to a state of compliance and dependency. So abuse is 
is the means to achieve this abuse and I have to say love and attention and all of all of the things that wrap up around coercive control. Um, entrapment is the end result. So the campaign to criminalize coercive control and the resistance to that has been raging over the past 12 months or so. Um, it seemed to come out of nowhere um, and was suddenly, I mean, it certainly didn't come out of nowhere. As we know in this field, nothing does, but it, it certainly exploded very quickly and was suddenly a national conversation. And um, it's often been quite confronting. It's divided a lot of people. Um, it's, it's created very heated confrontations that have been uncomfortable, um, but also extremely valuable. I think it's, it's, it's certainly outlined various schisms. It's outlined um, where people are at in terms of their uh, feelings about the criminal justice system and its response to domestic abuse. Um, and it's the debate itself has elevated community awareness about coercive control in a way that I, that I think few other things could have. Um, and to my mind, I guess the campaign to criminalise, which, you know, full disclosure for anyone who doesn't know I've been advocating for, um, has been an effort to update an antique legal system that sees domestic violence through an old fashioned prism, one that picks out disparate puzzle pieces, um, focuses on physical violence and doesn't even attempt to see the whole picture. So the idea really is to change the legal paradigm from criminalising incidents to criminalising the whole process of entrapment so that these patterns of oppressive and entrapping behaviour are made visible to the justice system and taken just as seriously as physical violence because that is the experience of victim survivors um, and those who want to use the criminal justice system. For 40 years, they've been telling us that the physical violence, if they experienced that, was, was often severe, was incredibly harmful, but it was not the thing that took them years or even decades to recover from in most cases. I mean, most cases, what they were what they were significantly impacted by was the ongoing humiliation, degradation, manipulation, gaslighting, um, and the way in which their lives were ruined in various ways, in you know, a kaleidoscope of, of ways, um, not least the way that their children could end up being removed from their care by the family law system um, once the relationship was over, or having to share care with someone that they, they know to be a dangerous person. Um, so to my mind, and I think we've seen this borne out in statistics across the UK where coercive control is criminalised, our incident-based system actually criminalises victims by default um, because it looks at their acts of violent resistance and self-defence entirely out of context. And as you know, you know, often a victim will confess to assaulting their partner, believing that police or the courts will see that they had good reason to do it. Like they can actually be you know, they're the honest person in the room because they know they had no choice. Um, or a manipulative perpetrator will convince the police to arrest their victim. And like one American cop, you know, memorably said, I've never had a bank robber convince me to arrest the clerk. You know, and yet that's what happens every other day with perpetrators of, of family violence. Um, because all they have to do is convince police and the courts that their victim committed a single act of violence, uh, throwing a phone, scratching, hitting, they don't have to prove there was a pattern. And they won't have, quite often, their own pattern of abuse become visible to the courts um, because the, just the admission of, of evidence, the sort of evidence that might prove coercive control, particularly non-physical, um, that evidence is not admissible. Um, it's not relevant. And interestingly, we just saw the latest data out of England on coercive control arrests and prosecutions. So in the year to December 2020, men made up 97.6% um, of prosecuted offenders and 98.2% of convicted offenders. Um, the conviction rate in England was around 53%. Uh, and that's largely because the test on um, the, the test in terms of like for getting to a conviction looks at the impact that the abuse had on the victim. So in Scotland, where the test is, would a reasonable person see this as um, behaviour that would cause fear, alarm or distress, the conviction rate is much higher. It's at 81%. I think there's also a better, a better um, prevalence of specialist courts there and they have a specialist prosecutor. Um, so six years after the introduction 
adoption of a coercive control offence across these various jurisdictions, it continues to be a highly gendered crime. Um, if you look at prosecution and conviction rates on domestic violence incidents um, in the UK prior to this and, and in, in Australia, you see a much higher proportion of women. Um, and that's because of what I've just outlined. An incident-based system will criminalise victims by default. So one pressing concern in Australia is obviously that coercive control will be too hard to prove. Um, as we've seen, particularly in Scotland, that's far from the case. In fact, this much broader range of evidence is now deemed admissible. Text messages, financial records, testimony from victims and their friends and family, photographs and so on. Um, because of the many ways in which coercive control is evidenced, um, and the specialist prosecutor says there that the vast majority of offenders are actually entering guilty pleas. So about 95% of convictions for coercive control by early 2020 were based on guilty pleas, which means the vast majority of cases didn't go to trial, which means also that victim survivors did not have to endure the re-traumatisation of the court process. But there are obviously many things that have to be considered um, before or whether any major new laws will be introduced. There are many valid objections. There are... Um, and many unknown hypotheticals. And we can talk more about this in the Q&A if, if there's still questions on that. But just briefly, and I know we've only got a couple of minutes, just to look at some other changes this year. We obviously had the abolition of the Family Court of Australia, a promise that Pauline Hanson made to her followers when she entered politics and ended up being able to make good on, um, and the merger with the Federal Circuit Court. Um, it's unclear how this is playing out right now for victim survivors across this system. I guess we will we'll be learning about this through research, you know, in years to come. Um, but certainly we saw horrifying statistics a few months ago um, for a research project that predates the merger that looked at um, the uh, judgments between 2012 and 2019 and found that only 12% of child sexual abuse allegations heard in the family law courts were substantiated and almost two thirds of allegedly unsafe parents had their time increased by the court, almost two thirds, with 17% of judgments seeing care switched entirely to the allegedly unsafe parent. Anyone familiar with the statistics around child sexual abuse allegations and the, um, and the percentage of false allegations would hear that and feel cold. Um, that only 12% are being substantiated. That's pretty much the flip side of what we know to be true of, um, of the truth of allegations um, in the family court system. So the family law system continues to be one of the most dangerous institutions for children in this country, but we have also seen the introduction of training for all family law professionals from David Mandel at the Safe and Together Institute. And I'm hearing really positive things from David and his partner, Ruth, about the inroads that they are making um, in that internal culture. We also saw Chief Justice Ulstergren, um, not someone you would consider a natural ally of the Me Too movement, publicly denounced the sexual harassment uh, from Judge Joe Harmon, who publicly had been a real ally to um, domestic violence victim survivors, but I, having seen some of his judgments, made some of the worst and most draconian judgments against um, children in that situation um, that I've ever seen. He was removed from the bench um, and this obviously followed the initiative of Chief Justice Susan Kiefel from the, Kiefel from the High Court to remove um, Justice Dyson Hayden following an inquiry. So there is, um, there is a real move in the courts, um, what employment lawyer Josh Bornstein describes as a cultural revolution, which is going to have an impact on how the courts see domestic abuse and sexual violence, particularly if you actually remove serial predators from the branch. Good idea. Um, we've also seen the long overdue elevation of survivor-led advocacy that is very much on the rise um, and, the, and the increasing recognition that we must centre victim survivors in our policy um, development and in, and in the way that we actually conceive of, of the future. Um, and clearly the impact of COVID and lockdowns has brought many services to the brink of what they can actually do. Um, and this is yet to play out, um, will continue to play out the impacts of COVID and the increases in approaches, not just with the increases in the severity of physical violence, which has actually been on, on the rise for several years and sexual violence particularly, but also the, um, the increase in first time reporters, which there are a number of factors there both perhaps the urgency with which they need help, but also 
um, the fact of sexual violence and abuse being so high on the public agenda this year and many um, survivors I've spoken to feeling emboldened to actually report what's going on, to not make the choice to be silent, um, which has had a lot to do with what we've been seeing in the public stage and the bravery of young women. So you look, you know, I'd love to go on and on for hours, um, <laughs> but somebody stopped me. So I, I, you know, I really want to hear your questions. I want to hear from the minister, um, but, you know, we know that we still need radically to change our approach in order to give the protection to victim survivors that they need um, to be able to give the resources and tools for their friends and family to help to protect them, even when those victim survivors may be resistant to help. Um, there is so much that still needs to be done with our systems. And I feel, but I feel like we are perhaps better than any other country in the world um, advancing towards an, an understanding and a paradigm change that sees the system of abuse for what it is and is starting to really understand what we need to do to tackle that. So thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Jess. Um, that was so interesting. Uh, what a year we've had and what a brilliant summary you just provided. Um, so that brings us to our Q&A part of the morning. And before we start, I'd just like to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from the Wandery lands of the Kulin Nation and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. And in the spirit of today, I'd also like to acknowledge all victim survivors of domestic and family violence without their voices and actions and experiences we simply would not be where we are now in this space. Now, we've received a number of great questions in advance of this event, and I do apologise that there's absolutely no way we're going to be able to get to them all or any of the questions posed in the chat for that matter. But please do keep the discussion going there. So what I've done is I've chosen a few of the submitted questions which sort of best reflect what seem to be common areas of interest. So we'll start with one around coercive control. Um, now, you touched on this in your talk, Jess, but the question is a number of feminist organisations and highly respected First Nations scholars have published well-researched papers opposing the criminalisation of coercive control and the creation of women police stations as a way forward. What's your comment on that critique? Yeah, well, I think it's been, um, as I said, like an enormously valuable conversation that's happened where, you know, We've had really difficult conversations about the criminal justice system, about its application to domestic violence, um, whether it's appropriate at all. I mean, the, the conversation around abolition has has really hit its stride this year and particularly, you know, um, the wind, really, the, the sales, you know, of abolition have been really buffeted by the wind of the Black Lives Matter movement and, and all the sort of discussions around defunding police. Um, any new law, particularly one like this, introduced around domestic abuse, um, has to be considered extremely carefully. We've seen since the 80s, well-intentioned laws go wrong. Um, and, you know, the, the sorts of stuff around not mandatory policing, but pro-arrest policing um, policies, obviously then lead to also um, arrests for victims um, that are totally unjustified. Um, so, I would say my response to that has been that there are that the the discussion in various groups is very varied. Um, I I have you know I spent months reading everything that I could, listening to as many different voices as possible, and trying to get across the various angles on this debate, and really you know drawing back to basics and and ready to actually disavow any pre-held positions that I had, you know, I'm not, I'm not attached to positions. If I've said something wrong, or if I've, if I feel like it's, it's something that's too risky, I'm happy to, to wind it back. I'm not a politician with an election promise, you know, um, what, where I differ, I guess, from some of the people who have raised objections to um, coercive control laws is that a, some, some of it is buttressed by um, abolitionist ideas around that we shouldn't have police respond to domestic violence, um, that they are not, they're not a safe institution. I totally um, agree with that. They are a very unreliable institution, that's for certain. Um, that they that you will see a larger misidentification of female victims. I, I actually entirely disagree with that analysis. Um, and I don't think there's any evidence to show that, particularly um, Scotland is not such a great 
example because it is 96% Caucasian, yeah. but in the UK where you have what their term is black and minority ethnic groups, um, but you have minority groups who are over-policed, who um, victims who are misidentified as perpetrators, um, particularly black women who, you know, so they have a lot of similar issues, not an Indigenous population, but they have analogous issues with their policing. Um, where we have not seen the any kind of rise in misidentification of victims. In fact, it's been completely the opposite. So I, I just, I don't see the basis for that critique, um, that mm -hmm. particular critique, but I can understand why certain communities are not excited about the idea of, um, of a lot of our efforts going into improving the criminal justice response to domestic violence because they don't see that as being central to how victim survivors in their community seek help. My, my position on it, and, and I guess I've consulted with lots of different people across the community. Obviously, Linda Burney um, from the Federal Labor Party has been a strong advocate for criminalisation. Dorinda Cox, the new senator from WA, um, Indigenous senator from WA, um, also a strong advocate for criminalisation, a former police officer herself. Um, so there are various positions within these groups as to how this will play out. Um, but yeah, I, I, I personally feel that for people who are entering the justice system, whether they report or whether someone else reports on their behalf, um, that they are done an enormous disservice by us continuing to have an incident-based system. Um, they're, what they say is the most important parts of their abuse is not visible to the criminal justice system. And I just don't see how, um, I don't see how that's a status quo that we should be ready to continue to accept. But, I do think that anything that changes in these laws needs to be done slowly with very wide consultation and approval from the you know, stakeholders and the people it's going to actually affect, much like they did in Scotland with a four-year process of co-writing um, the legislation. So I won't get into women's police stations now because I think we'll probably yeah. need to get to other questions, but, you know, there's, there's similar things. I think, you know, any good idea or any reasonable idea that sort of addresses major issues that we have, like women's police stations, where we a lot of women have, and particularly Indigenous women have a problem with reporting to a male officer because of there being certain things around women's business, but also any victim survivor, as we know, this is why we have a sector that's populated mostly by women that don't feel comfortable talking about their rape and a violation to a male officer necessarily that on its very own has has interesting sort of shows interesting potential for there being female officers that that re respond in the first instance but it's such a like these these ideas don't need to be rigid and rigid replications of what's happened overseas right. in fact you wouldn't want that um and there's no reason why you wouldn't like trial a women's police station somewhere like Logan in Queensland, for example, mm -hmm. and have the, that station represent the cultural diversity of that area. Like you don't need to replicate what we see in the mainstream police of white masculinist, you know, policing yeah. if you're starting something new. Um, yeah. So that's, yeah, just brief response to that. Look, that's, um, that's a terrific response. Thanks, Jess. And, and you're so right. The status quo is not working. The incident-based response is not working. So um, thanks for that. The next question is actually around media, which is one of my particular areas of interest. I'll be really interested to hear your response to this. And the question is, do you think that a shift in media reporting and the general narrative to focusing on the perpetrator's actions rather than the victim's sufferings would make a difference to how society um, views domestic abuse. And I think in particular, uh, the question is referring to those sort of passive headlines and some that spring to mind are things like, um, you know, a headline such as uh, bullet kills women, woman as if it was wandering down the street and just took an abrupt left turn, or woman suffers serious burns in the incident where the perpetrator is largely absent. Mm. Yeah, it's a really tricky question and a vexed one for journalists. I've sat in, on various like press council meetings and our watch councils like talking about this. The tricky thing is, is that the reason why it's written in the passive voice and centers the victim at first is because it's an it's still alleged a lot of the time. So you can't say man does this because the court has not found that. Mm -hmm. So it's actually 
illegal for reporters to send to the perpetrator in those those initial reports. You could say a man allegedly sets woman on fire. You could definitely, you know, put the perpetrator at the front of the sentence in that way. Um, but it's it's the, that's part of the reason why that passive language is used because the only real information that you can report is the result, not how that result was achieved because that is something to be determined by the courts. Um, however. I am very, very much a staunch advocate for putting the perpetrator back at the front of the mm -hmm. sentence um, and using actual active voice, as the yeah. questioner has pointed out, um, wherever that is possible and legal for journalists to do so. And knowing personally that when I was writing the book, every time I went to the passive sentence would come out easily. Um, it was like waiting inside me. It was just waiting to fall out of my fingers when I would do that mental gymnastics to put the perpetrator back at the front of the sentence it felt uncomfortable mm. it felt like a political act um and so I think that journalists definitely need to develop consciousness around it that you won't naturally go to do this until you've practiced many many times yeah. because our culture has invisibilized the perpetrator and it is mm. confronting to put them in in the scene but yeah, and I think that, you know, the whole, there's a lots of other issues around journalists quoting defence lawyers during court trials, but doing so in a way that looks like they're endorsing what the defence lawyer is saying is fact rather than actually just what is often a mendacious presentation of one, you know, of, of a, a story um, that, so there's so many things that Journalists, I think, in Australia definitely are becoming more aware of in various parts of the media. Um, but, yeah, definitely lots of work to be done there. And, and you need to have those journalists who are committed to the philosophy of what we're trying to achieve, um, who will go that extra mile to just think in those five minutes, how do maybe I don't write it like I always have. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think... Um... Some of the initiatives like the EVA Awards and the Our Watch Awards are doing a lot in that space to reward good reporting yes, um, and inform around, you know, some of those, those um, pitfalls, I suppose. Um, okay, so the next question, and there's two that are very similar, so I'll join those together, and it's do you see any improvement in collaborative working between different parts of the service system, for instance, police with specialist family violence agencies, <clears throat> child protection, et cetera, and the the other question, which is very similar, is as a facilitator in men's behaviour change, I would be keen to understand any emerging thinking about integrated practice, given the value of collaboration across both men's and women's um, specialist services. Yeah, I think that clearly that as a concept is advancing, you know, and that people are, I think the intellectual acknowledgement of it is perhaps advancing before the practice of it. Um, obviously in Victoria, this has been a big part of what you're doing under the Royal Commission um, recommendations. Um, but even the Orange Door, you know, what we've seen with um, the various Orange Door locations is that some of the criticism has been that you can't just lob everybody into one office and expect the collaboration to sort of like, you know, emerge with like pixie dust, you know, like just sprinkle a bit of dust on everyone and, and magic, you know, um, everyone's working together. And I think that justice reinvestment, some of those like truly integrative strategies, um, the way that they are achieved is like, like there is significant time invested in developing that collaborative um, environment. You actually need time outside of the work and inside the work together to make to, to bring people together, to overcome differences. Like you need to have all that stuff out on the table. You need to be able to hash it out and then you need to be able to come to a common ground. Um, so I think sometimes, yeah, we can be a little bit paint by numbers about how we think about integration and, co and collaboration instead of taking like a really deep holistic um, attitude to it, which, which acknowledges just how hard it is to achieve that. Yeah. Thank you. That's, um, that's a great answer. And I'm going to squeeze one more question in, if you don't mind. Um, we've got so many, so it it's, was wonderful to see everybody getting on board with those, um, those questions before the event. But um, this one is, why do you think we, and I thought I'd end with a general question, why do you think we are so slow as a community, um, as a society, 
In taking action to fix um, domestic violence in this country, as discussed in the last chapter of your book? Mm. Um, because of so many reasons, um, patriarchy, if you give a one-line answer, it'd be really glib, um, you know, but, you know, the family is like, yeah, it's the, it's the last bulwark of patriarchy like a lot of our gender and equality work and all the rest of it has been in public um and there are feminists like ann summers who look back on the work of the 70s and 80s and say we went outside of the home too quickly we wanted to achieve this gender equality in the workplace and, and in public life and we abandoned the home um such that you so you've got these women who are doing fantastic work, leadership positions, busy lives, but are still doing the majority of the housework, you know, like, so we, we kind of didn't address the home to the same degree as we addressed what was happening in public life. Um, and I, I think that's not just a failing of the feminist movement. It's a very, it's very understandable why they went for that public power. Um, but it, it also reflects the fact that the family is a very difficult place to reform. It's the, it is really the, the home base of, of patriarchy. Like you reform the family and that's it. Like that's, that's the nexus of our patriarchal society. It's why I think the family law system is the most intractable system. Mm. Because once you actually start giving women and children the right to be safe, what does that mean? for the rights of fathers or the rights of, of male control over the family. It's, a, it's, it's the, one of the biggest um, philosophical challenges of modern society. How do we undo patriarchy? How do we undo this system of male domination that we brought in, you know, ostensibly the kind that we have now started bringing in around 12,000 years ago? Mm -hmm. um, so why have we not moved more quickly? Because there's gigantic resistance um, because we are yet to, to really, we're yet to have the leaders, especially at a federal level, but even community to really acknowledge how destructive this is to our society, to our communities, to our families. And I think a large part of that has been partly a misunderstanding of what domestic violence is. And that's why I find coercive control to be such an exciting concept um, and our growing understanding of it because people are starting to understand what is actually going on in a lot of these relationships, um, the artificial enforcement of a type of control and domination and subjugation um, environment that we thought we had long overcome, you know, mm -hmm. um, that was a, it was a sort of a relic of the past, that that is being inflicted in households across Australia um, and is mirrored in our institutions. So this going from basically this, this, I think, very antique idea of what domestic violence is to what we have been developing as a modern understanding of it, I think we'll actually start to see our processes and our, and our responses improve and accelerate because I've never seen politicians so engaged as when I've been talking to them about coercive control. It's like a light bulb goes on in their head and they're like, now I understand. It doesn't mean that people like Scott Morrison and Christian Porter and, and, and the like are going to be like, oh, now I understand. Well, I'm going to sort myself out and fix it. You know, you are going to have people who are not interested, will never be interested and will never see this as something, as a, as something that is valuable to work on. Um, so we need to vote them out, basically. Yeah. Um, when you see them, yeah. we need to campaign yeah. for them to be unelected. Um, and that's, that's, that's the fight we'll have um, forever. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Oh, thank you. And that was a, a great one to finish on because it was sort of optimistic at the same time as um, tying back to what you were talking about in your, your talk itself. Look, thank you so much for your generosity, Jess. Um, I'm going to pass back to Connor Mullen, our Chief of Education now, to introduce the Minister. But thank you again. Um, My pleasure. Really, thank you, Ilsa. Really, really interesting. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Ilsa. And thank you, Jess, not just for this morning, but also your tireless um, investig investigative, um, you know, reporting on these matters. And I think, you know, it's, it's the energy and effort of people like you and other journalists that, you know, continue to raise and surface these issues make us face them and keep them in the public discourse. So I, I thank you very much for that. Um, as mentioned, uh, I'd now like to uh, introduce Minister Williams. 
who will help us officially open the Family Violence Training Hub at Chisholm. Thanks, uh, thanks, Connor. And before I begin, please let me acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're gathered. I'm cu currently on Bunurong country and pay my respects to elders um, past and present. I also want to acknowledge uh, any victim survivors of family violence that we had uh, we have with us here today and to remember those who have lost their lives as a consequence of family violence and those who continue to live with the trauma of it um, each and every day. I think when we have gatherings like this, we're all acutely aware of what brings us all together and reminded of the importance um, of the work that we're all um, so committed to. Um, to. To Dr. Ilsa Evans, a big um, thank you, not only uh, for your presence today, but also for your ongoing commitment to family violence education across our vocational education sector. And uh, a big thanks to Jess Hill too, who's obviously been a very significant part of elevating this discussion nationally um, uh, in recent times. Um, and somebody whose um, passion, I think, for this topic is, is really evident. And I think she was right to describe this as an accountability movement because it is, um, and, it's, uh, and, it's, uh, and it's a movement where uh, accountability extends from government all the way down to um, our universal service system, to um, our families uh, and the way we raise our children. It is cradle to grave um, work. And uh, and, and that is, you know, that is difficult, as we know, cultural change can be very, very slow and challenging. But thank you, Jess, for your, playing your part um, and, and helping bring others, others with you in this discussion. I also, of course, want to acknowledge that today is International Day of the Elimination of Violence Against Women. A day, of course, to remind ourselves of the persistence of this issue, uh, but also, of course, of the importance of our, our work. But also for me, it's uh, it's a chance to reflect on those who have come before, to acknowledge that we stand on the shoulders of generations of women who have fought for change at times when the community really wasn't open to having this discussion, let alone to acting upon it. And so I'm always conscious that here in Victoria on the back of the Royal Commission into Family Violence, which was handed down five years ago, that it's all well and good for me to stand here and talk about um, the investment that we've made over that period of time, the focus in a policy sense on this issue and how exciting that is and how much um, credit we should be given when the reality is there are many um, and many I'm sure who are sitting in this room who have been a part of this discussion and trying to drive it for literally decades, 40 or 50 years, who must feel like we are very late to the party, um, but no doubt probably pleased that we've got there um, in the end. But without um, those people, without those predominantly women, we wouldn't be here. Um, it, is, it has been a long journey and long overdue, and we've still got a long way to go. I also want to thank all of you who are attending here today and um, to recognise at the outset the enormous contribution um, of, of so many um, people across our family violence sectors, and I say plural very um, uh, consciously because we often talk about a family violence sector and it's not one sector, it's many different sectors that intersect around this issue. But I wanted to acknowledge at the outset that um, the work that's being done across these sectors, particularly over the last 20 months or so, um, has been uh, incredibly challenging. And the commitment of uh, though that workforce during this time has been second to none, it's been remarkable. Having to do things differently in a COVID environment has meant in those sectors bringing the gravity of that work into people's homes. And that is an incredibly, incredibly challenging reality. Um, and so not only has this pandemic had a significant impact on um, uh, women experiencing violence in our community, it's had a, a really significant impact on the sectors um, that support them. So thank you um, to those of you who have um, continued uh, with your commitment over this time and, and so many of you I know been um, kind of further inspired I guess or you know by the challenges of the time and, and what that's meant um, on the ground in our in our communities. Um, and as, as Jess highlighted too, although a lot of the, the discussion in recent times has been around impacts of family violence of COVID itself, we know that the um, uh, the, the rates of reporting were tracking up even before COVID, long before COVID, and that has in, uh, been absolutely, I think, a product of the fact that there has been elevated discussions around this issue, um, that it has um, empowered people to, to reach out for help. And here in Victoria, it's also been a product of the fact that there has been um, greater confidence expressed in parts of our system that have seen that sort of start to now emerge into areas of our service system um, that we would want to see 
um, people reaching out to um, in their time of need, um, which of course has brought with it and relevant to today, the need for us to expand the size of our family violence workforce to ensure that those who are experiencing family violence and also, also those who are perpetrating that violence um, are met with the specialist responses that they need. And in addition to that, the Royal Commission here told us that we needed to enhance the understanding of family violence across our universal services as well, understanding that they are the more common touch points in our community for people um, who need help. People don't tend to walk straight into a specialist service. They're more likely to, to appear to a, a GP or through their kids' school or any number of other um, systems which we know are a very um, uh, normal part of, of, of the course of daily life for most of us. Uh, and so today I think Mark's really important step on that path as we officially launch the Chisholm Institute Family Violence Hub. And it's particularly special for me, not, um, not only as a Minister for the Pre Prevention of Family Violence, but also as a member for Danny Nong, uh, having Chisholm in my backyard and having it be such an important part of our local community, a, a place that really represents opportunity um, for a very diverse community um, in Danny Nong. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, it's been a really proud journey for me as a local MP, but also a member of a government who, which has partnered um, with TAFE, TAFE to such a significant extent to make education more accessible and to ensure that Victorians have the skills they need for, for the jobs they want effectively. And, of course, um, to acknowledge that you've been a really important partner to the government um, in our family violence reform. Uh, and I'll touch on that a little bit. Um, uh, particularly in, in relation to courses that I know that you will be offering from next year um, as a part of some of our recent investment around both gender equity and identifying and responding to family violence risk, um, which are, are two incredibly uh, important courses and will effectively be vital to upskilling, uh, particularly community services to support uh, Victorians to um, not only identify family violence, but to know what to do about it, to know how to refer um, so that we can ensure effectively that interventions happen earlier, um, which we know um, is critical to us meeting the promise that we've made about ending family violence. There is, uh, of course, a, a place for crisis response and we need it. Um, but in many respects, it's the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff. What we need to be doing is making sure that we can intervene earlier or, or indeed prevent before it starts if we really won't want to be achieving um, the outcome that I think we all desire. Uh, and, you know, through that work of upskilling workforces and, um, and different parts of our workforces, um, that's been a really um, central part of our reform here in Victoria and a very challenging part, I think. Um, you know, not only, well, as an example, to give you a size of the scale, through our MARAM program, our risk assessment frameworks, which require training to a whole range of universal um, services and sectors to be able to play their part in identification and referral, we've effectively built a common understanding or are building a common understanding about what family violence looks like and what needs to be done in order to address it among now about 370,000 workers. Um, uh, and and that's, uh, that takes in, for example, GPs, ambulance services, hospitals, community health, schools and early childhood education as well, basically those critically important um, touch points in our community um, that I mentioned before. And this work is ongoing. That will continue to be expanded because this is really about um, that accountability and us all recognising that we have a role to play uh, and how significant that is. But that, that workforce component is incredibly challenging um, and we will continue to upskill workers, um, both those already in the workforce, but also targeting, targeting those emerging workers through their sort of pre-service qualification so that, that when they enter the workforce, they do so armed with the knowledge and skills to prevent and respond to family violence. And TAFE has been a really, really um, critical part of that. Look, I just wanted to touch on the last 18 months in particular um, and, and, uh, and also touch on a few of the points Jess so eloquently made. Uh, we know that that conversation around co coercive control and indeed a conversation about sexual violence has been propelled into the public realm and it needed to be. As a Minister for the Prevention of Family Violence here, five years on from the Royal Commission, I've often reflected on the fact that the conversation around family violence um, was elevated publicly, but the conversation about sexual violence was really slow to follow, and it needed to. Um, you know, uh, and uh, and it's been, even though it, it is it is um, erupted onto a, a public stage uh, out of out of significant trauma, and um, 
via the voices of people who have given so much of themselves and shared so much of their own experience in order for us to be having those conversations. It's so important um, that we are. Jess touched on coercive control and the diversity of views that exist around it and, and what we in, in how we should deal with it, particularly among victim survivors and, and marginalised um, groups. But I think despite that diversity of opinion about how we deal with it, there certainly is agreement that coercive control is dangerous and that it needs a whole of system approach in order to, to be able to deal with it. Um, and the fact is that it is inherent in it, it is an inherent part of, of, of basically all forms of family violence. It's also um, not only bad in and of itself, but but a warning sign uh, for what may well be life threatening risk, as, as Jess outlined. And for that reason, we need to take it really seriously. Here in Victoria, we're a little bit unique. We are in family violence um, reform generally, but um, coercion control is recognised as family violence by by law. Or it, it is. Um, explicitly defined as a form of family violence in uh, our Family Violence Protection Act, and it sits alongside economic, psychological, emotional, physical, and sexual abuse. But it's also recognised as family violence in current policy settings in Victoria as well, and is recognised in those risk assessment frameworks that I talked about earlier, and that education piece with our um, our universal services. And it's been a significant part of our reform to to practice in a whole range of areas. You know, we have now have dedicated family violence training centres for police. Um, it's a part of our, you know, specialist family violence courts. That's not to say it's all perfected yet, but it is increasingly ingrained into what we expect in service delivery, not just in the specialist family violence service sectors, but indeed in a range um, in, of sectors across our community, um, universal and, and specialist. And of course, there's always though more that we can be doing uh, to enhance the way our system responds to family violence and its component parts. And that's why we're really continuing to look at our legal and policy frameworks to ensure that our system can and does adequately respond to a victim's whole of whole of um, whole experience of family violence and not just those isolated incidents that um, that Jess outlined. And for all the reasons that she outlined, you know, we need to make sure that we have a really deep and comprehensive understanding around this, particularly to avoid misidentification, which I think Jess touched on. Um, really neatly and was an area that is an area that is a, a huge passion of mine. And so this work continues. So finally, I just want to say a big thank you to Chisholm for, for its commitment to end family violence and for partnering with the government to deliver world leading reform. Uh, the Victorian government has invested so far on the back of the Royal Commission $3.5 billion. And now I, I say that um, I'm always reluctant to use dollar figures to um, explain system reform because it gets to a certain amount of money and then we can't kind of process whether that's a lot or not, right? We don't know whether that's a small bit of money, a big bit of money. But I think to put that in context, that's more than all of the other states combined and more than the Commonwealth as well. And, uh, you know, Jess mentioned the Orange Door being a foundational part of that, mo that model. And it is, and it is about integrated practice. And it certainly isn't about just sort of opening up a site and co-locating people and hoping that leads to to better outcomes, um, these sites come with really extensive lead-in times where the different partner organisations work together for at least 12 months before the doors open, um, or sometimes even longer, and the, and the work continues once they're there. Uh, and we use um, the knowledge and the data that we're able to gather out of that to inform our reform going forward. So this is a constant uh, learning exercise um, and one that we want to share with other jurisdictions. We're not selfish about that. It's so important that we're able to share our learnings, say what works, what doesn't work, not only use that to improve our own practice, but to share that with others. And I thought Jess's open, opening remarks about the federal government in that space are really pertinent, not out of politics, but to say we all have a role to play. And it's really important that the federal government be playing that role in their um, own space, within their jurisdiction, to address the things that they, or to pull the levers that only they can reach effectively. Uh, state jurisdictions, we have limitations and there's lots that we can do, but there's um, also lots that we can't that we rely on the federal government to do. And um, part of my role is to make sure that we hold them to account as well to, to, um, to be able to take action where they can. But look, as we, um, as we start to connect up all this system, all of our various systems, including through our education and training, our systems will get stronger. They will better meet the needs um, of our community which is why I'm really delighted to be here to officially launch the Chisholm Institute Family Violence Hub. We know that together we will achieve a vision of a Victoria 
free from violence, to ensure that our workforce is supported to respond to family violence and importantly, to prevent it from occurring in the first place, um, not only right now, but well into the future. And, uh, and what you're um, uh, celebrating today through the launch of the hub is a really central um, part of that. So thank you very much. And it's a pleasure to join you for it. Thank you so much, Minister Williams, um, and a very insightful commentary from yourself as well off the back of um, Jess's presentation. And, and thank you for taking the time to be here with us this morning, but also the support that you provide Chisholm, um, the TAFE network, and, and certainly uh, pushing to have these sort of programs and courses delivered across the state. Now, it is 11 o'clock, which was the time we were scheduled to end. If people are able to stick around, I'd absolutely welcome you to because I am going to hand over to Raylene Stockton, who is the Manager of Community and Social Services at Chisholm, and also Lena Cummings, who is the Family Violence Training Hub Coordinator. Both of them have been instrumental in the development of the Family Violence Training Hub and its associated program offerings. And they're just going to give a bit of a brief overview um, of the Training Hub and some further information. So thank you. Okay, um, so uh, can I, uh, sorry, am I on spotlight now? You sure are. Oh, great, thank you. You're still on my spotlight. Sorry about that, people. Um, okay, it's just come up. Uh, it's been great to hear Jess Hill and Minister Williams speak and have the opportunity to have some of our um, question answered. And, you know, I'm really grateful for everyone joining us um, here today and for the support for this event. It's been overwhelming. Um, but it's really with, you know, much excitement and pleasure that, um, you know, part of what we're here today is also to launch the Chisholm's Family Violence Training Hub under the Department of Community and Social Services. And it may seem like this initiative has just popped up, you know, over, overnight. Um, however, it's been, it's taken more than 10 years of persistence and commitment and, you know, um, ensuring that people are, are aware of the purpose and the need of the role that a family violence training hub can play. And um, I guess, you know, luckily that, you know, that there has been teachers that have moved on that have played a role in that, but there's still several teachers and um, members of the Chisholm community that are still here that have actually been able to see this come to fruition. And I guess, you know, we have an important role to, to play, particularly when we look at the levels of awareness that I think, think still exist in um, the community around um, family violence and attitudes towards that. So the, in 2017, the National Community Attitudes Towards Violence Women's Survey found that there were still, you know, violence supportive attitudes um, in the community, which included um, excusing perpetrators, perpetrators and holding women responsible, disregarding the need to gain consent, minimising violence against women and mistrust women's um, reports of violence. So less than half Australians recognise the fear from um, domestic and family violence are worse than women. And the last, the, the previous time this was done it was in 2013, and there was some change, but no significant change with that. Um, and so while these findings do show that there's, you know, a cause for optimism to actually move through to um, a positive, you know, view in relation to supporting women experiencing, you know, family violence, it by no means enables us to be in a place of complacency. And I think that's a really vital part that education can play in actually um, having, you know, promoting awareness, providing education about how we can understand and support women to, um, you know, access services and be, you know, open to reaching out when, when they're able to, to ask for that support. Um, I guess what we we sort of need to need to look at is you know building towards um, cultures of safety, respect, and equality for all women and Australians, 
And I guess Chisholm's commitment to establishing the Family Violence Training Hub and running training um, as part of the uh, events to bring the community together is one way that we can sort of um, step to progress this. And I guess, you know, that's really been valuable to have you here with us today to share in this. And as Connor mentioned, um, Lena Cummins is the Family Violence Training Hub Coordinator, who has been instrumental in, you know, moving um, uh, this, this forward um, as well. And I'd just like to hand over to her now to just give you a bit more insight into what the Family, the family Violence Training Hub is. Thanks, Raylene. Um, yeah, so as um, Minister Williams said, that we can all really play a role, I guess, in that elimination of violence against women. And the Family Violence Training Hub um, is one way I, that Chisholm's working towards this. Um, the hub raises awareness about family violence through events like the one that we've all attended today. Um, and you can go to the landing page and check out our past events. We've got videos um, of events we've run in the past and it, as well as find out about any future events that we have coming up. Uh, the hub is about bringing together family violence and gender equity training opportunities. Um, as we know, the family violence sector is growing. And so we are developing training in response to that. So the landing page again is, is somewhere where you can go and find out about those various training opportunities that we offer. And as we develop those, we'll be updating the landing page. Um, and so the Family Violence Training Hub is also about supporting our family violence teachers here at Chisholm. And we're, we're doing that through the establishment of a community of practice. And it's the first time that we've adopted that model in our department um, and it's working really well, I guess. Uh, teaching family violence can be challenging sometimes. Um, some of our teachers can face um, resistance to the concepts that they teach. And so the community of practice has been um, really successful in terms of providing a positive space for teachers to get support, uh, to share resources and ideas, as well as to build their practice. Um, and so the hub is also, it's enabled us to really build a best practice model when it comes to family violence teaching in the VEX sector. And it's created a space for us to um, really, I guess, um, consult with industry, have that engagement and develop those connections as well. And we'll continue to seek feedback and consult um, and really, I guess, to make sure that we're meeting the needs of our students, of our teachers and of the, of the family violence. Oh, sorry, the family violence sector, can't get my words out. Um, and I guess that's it really, that's all, I, um, I think that's it from us. Um, and so thank you all for sticking around and thank you all for coming along today. And yeah, go, go and check out our landing page. Thanks. Wonderful, thank you, Lena and Raylene uh, for giving us that overview of the family violence training hub at Chisholm. It, it, as you said, it's a very exciting initiative. You know, it, it's obviously something that we wish we didn't have to have, um, but we're proud to have it um, and to be championing uh, family violence training for both um, primary prevention and also response. I'd like to thank all of our, um, of, of Jess, our presenter today, Minister Williams uh, for coming along and officially opening uh, the, the hub and also Ilsa for your uh, facilitation of the Q&A session. Uh, again, apologies that we didn't manage to get to all of the questions. Um, there were some incredibly um, poignant questions um, there, and, and we will endeavour to try and get a response. Also, this uh, has been recorded, the event, um, so we will be posting it, I think, uh, to YouTube um, and also on the Family Violence Training Hub landing site on our webpage. So thank you again for taking the time to join us this morning uh, for this very important issue. We appreciate your support, and we'll speak to you soon.